You're listening to the Turn Autism Around podcast, episode number 231. I'm your host, Dr. Mary Barbera, and today we are doing something brand new. We recorded the top five questions about stimming and scripting, but we recorded it as a live Facebook uh, feed on marybarbera.com forward slash Facebook. And it worked out great. We got additional questions. We got a lot of people viewing live and I'm sure on the recording too. So um, it we probably will do this uh, again, uh, most podcasts, I would think. And um, so, yeah, that was exciting. And um, we covered stimming, scripting, when it's a a uh, thing that we need to worry about. Is it a sign of autism um, and how we can get kids learning more so that the stimming, whether it's dangerous or impeding their learning or very excessive, um, can go down naturally easily and the child will uh, be happier, more independent, have more language skills So let's get to this great episode with Kelsey asking the top five questions about stimming and scripting. Okay, we have Kelsey back to our podcast to discuss the top five questions we get on stimming and scripting. It's a very hot topic um, kind of a controversial topic, another controversial topic for us, Kelsey, to tackle. And in last week's podcast, episode 230, um, we we did a rebroadcast of a stimming uh, podcast I did years ago. So we're going to follow up with that and really hopefully answer your questions about stimming and scripting. So Without further delay, let's go with our first question, Kelsey. Let's go with our first question. So our first question is, what is stimming and scripting? Yeah, so stimming is self-stimulatory behavior, and it can be either physical, verbal, or both. Um, And stimming, we all stim, actually. So let's just like take it all the way back to all of our leisure activities are self-stimulatory. It's basically what keeps our neurons firing in our brain when we're not engaged in um, tasks or jobs or uh, social, you know, social with people. It's, it's basically our leisure activities when we're by ourselves. So I give the examples that I learned early on is that like playing a violin, you know, we play it and, and if we hear the wrong notes, that doesn't sound good. It's not reinforcing, but we, we hear the right notes after many hours of practice. And that is, that feels good. It sounds good. You're making progress. Um, also playing basketball, you shoot, um, until you make a basket and you keep score and it, it by yourself, you know, these are, uh, self-stimulatory behavior by yourself automatic reinforcement uh, for those behavior analysts that are listening. Um, It is all of our leisure activities. Scrolling through Facebook is a leisure activity and it's self-stimulatory. It doesn't involve people, which is socially mediated. So it's not socially mediated, it's automatic. So stimming just by its definition is absolutely not a bad thing. We all stim, it keeps us uh, engaged. If you are at a lecture and you don't understand the language or it's too boring or it's too advanced, um, you are going to do other things. You're going to doodle. That's self-stimulatory behavior. You might be playing with your hair. You might sneak your phone under the desk and start scrolling through Facebook, <laughs> um, waiting in line at the grocery store. You are um, you know, engaging in whatever kind of tasks keep you busy. So. That's stimming. And um, also stimming can also be very kind of low level stims like rocking, you know, a child that doesn't have the skills to 
play basketball, scroll through Facebook or talk might rock to uh, self-stimulate them. Um, They might um, bang their head either softly or hardly as part of that rocking. I've had several clients who have done that. One to a point where we have an open lesion on his head, you know, when I started. So um, rocking, um, taking a pen and flapping it in front of your face or any kind of long instrument, um, flapping your hands in front of your face. Um, And then there's verbal stimming. Uh, which can just be moaning, making noises. Make uh, Lucas had that like at three and four. He was talking a little bit, but he would also make loud noises. Um, and then there's scripting, which is usually a higher uh, form of stimming, and that can that's also delayed echolalia. We've done podcasts and video blogs on on echolalia and delayed uh, echolalia, which is scripting. So memorizing movie movie lines or lines that they've heard before um, and coming out with those scripts. So that is what stimming is and scripting is. And um, yeah, we, we see it a lot in the autism world. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have much to add on that. I think that's a good definition of stimming and scripting. Um, and, and last week's episode, we talk all about, you know, more of the definition and, and more of the steps to, uh, reduce it. If that's, if it's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll get into whether you should or shouldn't reduce yeah. it, uh, right here on this podcast today. So, um, the next question is why do kids with autism stim and script? Yeah, and really it's because they haven't developed um, typical play skills, typical social skills, and language skills. So um, it, it really is that they're kind of stuck more in that, you know, babies who can't talk, who can't, you know, throw balls and things like that they tend to babble, they tend to move their arms around and, and take a a rattle and shake it in front, you know, it, it's, um, babies keep themselves busy with these more, uh, primitive, more, uh, basic stimulatory behavior. And, um, so it, it's really the lack of advancement um, in little kids, it's lack of advancement in social language um, and leisure skills. But it can also be, you know, for older kids and even adults, you know, it it can just be like they could have full language and they could have the ability to post on social media and they still like to have you know, fidget toys or self-stimulatory behaviors, they still might, you know, spend time, you know, flapping their arms or, or um, doing self-stimulatory behavior or scripting things. I mean, when you think about like even typically developing adults, we all have kind of our things. I mean, there's, there's adults that still sleep with a teddy bear or something, you know, a blanket and they like to rub it to fall asleep or, um, you know, have something to fidget with. It's not, it doesn't, it's not bad. You know, like some people just like different sensory experiences. And, um, but I think in general, the reason why it happens so much in autism or toddlers with signs of autism is that they're not advancing with other play skills or not advancing with language skills and with social skills. Yeah, I, I would agree with all those points. I think also, I mean, why some individuals might stem is, is, as you said, playing violin might feel good to you. These might feel good to them. So they may do it more when they're highly stressed. If they're in pain, they may do it more. Um, And since a young child, especially with autism and even older ones, really struggle to communicate, especially when stressed. And so sometimes it's a, it's a real form of communication. And if you, you know, see something where 
they're not really stimming and then they start stimming a lot all the time, it could be a signal that, you know, something is off. So, um, yeah, I like the stress, you know, when we're stressed, we do things like, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a crier, but if I were highly stressed, I might start, you know, crying or I don't swear much unless I'm stressed and then I (laughs) might swear more. So, you know, we all have our stress reduction techniques, which we always, you know, end each podcast interview uh, with our with our stress reduction tips and things like that. But, um, but you know, when we're stressed, we we can tend to need more of those more primitive stims and more, you know, comforting things uh, that felt good as a young child and now still feel good. Yeah. And I, and I think you're bang on with uh, that. A lot of kids, especially young kids with autism, they can't uh, young toddlers fill their days with exploring their world and exploring their environment and engaging with mom and dad and helping around the house. And a lot of our two, three, four year olds with autism may have a developmental level of a baby and that's what they're going to do all day to engage themselves is the tapping is the stomping is lining things up. You know, they're going to do those things because they don't know what else to do and their brains need engagement and stimulation. And um, yeah, so that's, that would conclude that one. Our next question is, um, if my child is stimming, does that mean they for sure have autism? No, it doesn't mean for sure anything. Um, I do know personally little kids and and even older kids who um, look like they have more primitive stims, like more like I knew a boy that grew up with Spencer and he was typically developing and he'd have you know, he would rub his hands like that when he would get stressed or rock. Um, and his mom was like, why does he do that? And I'm like, I don't know, you know, <laughs> but it's not hurting anything. So it's fine. Um, we had had Rachel on the podcast a few times talking about Everett's speech delay and then Everett's hitting and throwing. We can link those in the show notes. This podcast is two, three, one. Um, so they'll be in the show notes, but Everett when he was little, he, he had a fair amount of stimming and he still does. And, and, you know, from time to time when he gets excited and he never had any indicators of autism, just speech delay. And now he's completely caught up and doing great. And if he gets excited, he might flap his arms. So, you know, no one should panic if they see stimming. It's just, we all stim. And so it's just taking, uh, you know, okay, he's, he's really excited or really stressed. It doesn't happen all day long. He's developing with language and with imitation and social skills, not a big deal. So it's, it's, it could be a sign of autism, um, but it doesn't have to be for sure. Yeah. I just, like you said, I I would agree. I think um, often we get questions about young babies who are, you know, doing some of these things and, Stimming on its own is not a problem. It's when it's combined with, you know, speech delays, excessive tantrum, not pointing, um, you know, other things when we want to start worrying. It's usually just a piece. Um, when they are diagnosing autism, they look at delays and social communication delays and repetitive behaviors, which is stimming. So it is normally present in some form. Uh, in individuals that will be diagnosed with autism, but it doesn't mean that just because you have that without column A of all the social communication delays, it doesn't mean it's autism necessarily. So let's go to the next question. Um, When is stimming a problem and when it should be, when should it be left alone? And um, yeah, we're doing this live right now and I'm monitoring some of the comments and a lot of them are, are, are that question is, is when, is it a problem? When should it be left alone? What about this type of STEM and this type of STEM? And um, yeah. Yeah. How would you answer that? Well, that's a great question. And um, 
I think the first step to anything, any problem behavior, skill deficit, anything is assessment. Um, And luckily I created last year, I took the one page assessment that's in my turn autism around book. We paid and invested a ton of money and time into a digital assessment, which I said was going to be free for the first thousand people. More than 20,000 parents and professionals have taken the digital assessment and it's still free. And it's at marybarbera.com forward slash assessment. And you can take that, uh, you know, as soon as you're done listening to this. And we're really, we're, we're not diving into STEM. Uh, right away. We're looking at language. We're looking at problem behaviors, imitation, and we're getting a snapshot in 10 minutes of where your child or client is at in terms of self-care and daily activities, eating, sleeping, grooming, dressing, potty. We're looking at, you get a score in language and learning skills, and then you get a score in problem behaviors. And stimming, mostly stimming, could be scripting, could be, is a problem behavior if it's, first of all, causing any kind of injury. Like I talked earlier about the boy who was only two, who banged his head on hard and soft surfaces. So when I got there, he had an open wound on his head. And I'm also a registered nurse. So this is, you know, a, a big concern. If you have any kind of injury, um, repetitive banging, repetitive anything that's causing injury, that is something that is definitely a problem behavior, definitely needs reduction. Um, we need to get the kids safe. Now, if you have, like Lucas did when he was little, um, verbal vocal stimming of making noises, yelling out, blah, 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 you know, babbling, you might say, well, that's not a problem, Mary. That, why should we stop stimming? Well, as a mom, it's it's impossible to take a child who has major vocal stimming um, to church, to um, restaurants. Um, he went to typical preschool his whole his whole early life, and so that doesn't bode well. You know, you might think, well, he's autistic. Everybody should just embrace and accept him. If he's making those kind of noises during story time, you know. It is impeding his learning and the learning of others. And so um, I am not all about like, let's stamp out stimming. No, let's assess, assess in all areas, self-care, language, and problem behavior. Stimming could be happening all throughout the day, could be, you know, so extreme. That's the other thing. So if it's causing injury, yes, we want to reduce it. If it's completely disruptive to the child, the family, and other people, yeah, we probably want to reduce it. And um, if it's excessive, it's constant. Um, Because really, if I am sitting here uh, doodling, watching reality TV, scrolling through Facebook, um, if I'm doing any stimming behavior and you're trying to teach me something, um, my mind is not available for that. So we have to look at stimming, um, as something normal, but if it's excessive, if it's causing harm, if it's, um, impeding learning, and if it's excessive, then we need to reduce it, but we don't reduce it by like, hyper-focusing on it. The way to reduce it is to bring up your skills. You're going to want to bring up the skills, whether the child has excessive stimming or scripting anyway. You're going to want to bring up language, you're going to want to bring up social skills and bring up leisure activities. So in the end, stimming is is just not that important to focus on. Um, what's important is that you do the assessment and you make a plan and it's just part of it. You know, we we had, for instance, um, one of my clients who I saw for an independent evaluation when she was five years of age, um, she was looked pretty good. She was an intermediate learner. 
And she's she's got some videos in my intermediate learner course because mom granted me permission to share her videos. And, you know, she could talk and she was potty trained and she had a lot of stimming and scripting. And even though she could talk, she was kind of obsessed with like one of the things she was obsessed with was taking long instruments like a pen or a spatula in a play kitchen and flapping it in front of her eyes. Um, she would also script and she would also, um, I forget what the other STEM behaviors were. I remember the spatula in the kitchen being big. So I observed her in three different settings. I observed her at home. I observed her at her, uh, developmental delay preschool. And I uh, observed her in regular preschool or daycare with, uh, a person there with her shadow. And over the day, Every 15 minutes, I use partial interval data and I uh, tracked stimming, other problem behaviors, other other things I was counting. But 90% of the intervals, she had some kind of stimming or scripting. And it wasn't horrible. It wasn't like, let's stamp this out. It wasn't causing injury, but it was disruptive. She wasn't really learning and progressing very well. And then over the next two years, I worked with her. I went weekly. She had a really good team in place. Her mom was highly motivated. Um, and this little girl did really well. And um, her stimming went down uh, to near zero levels. And people are like, well, how'd you do that? Well, two years of good teaching and reinforcement and a gradual increase in her language, social and leisure activities. So in the end, it's not a problem unless it's really causing injury. And for everybody, we're going to want to increase your skills, start with the assessment. Yeah, I would very much agree with that. And also we get questions a lot in our toddler preschooler course, like when I'm doing this, my child is just throwing objects or dumping objects or lining them up. How do I stop it? Or should I stop it? And in that case, it's like, if a child is safe, they're engaging themselves in safe items you are busy, so you can't engage them. Um, That's actually a good skill at that time. Um, We want to morph it into, you know, more leisure skills and things. But at that time, if we just stamped out that stimming and was like, this is a problem, you'd have a problem because what what else are they going to do? Um, Because that's what they're doing. So if you have safe stims, um, yes, we want to make a plan to, but we do want to recognize that it's, it's actually can be a good thing. And scripting wise, Brentley scripts a lot and it can be a problem in certain situations. You know, my younger son's concerts, you know, different situations, but as he's gotten older, we've been able to teach him, you know, when it's a good time, you know, to script and, and when it's not. And sometimes we're at things like my younger son's soccer and yeah, tell yourself a story the whole time. Like there's nothing else for you to do. And and it's a really good way for him to engage himself. So it's good. It's hard sometimes to be able to find that balance. Um, But remember the number one thing is keeping kids safe and happy um, and learning. And so use that as your guide to figure out if it needs more intervention or not. And I love what you said about safe stims. And, you know, when, Our consultant came in in 1999 when Lucas was diagnosed. My husband um, said, you know, she lets him watch TV too much. Like we need to like turn off the TV because he was kind of obsessed and he still is with with watching, you know, VHS tapes. And um, and she was like, well, you don't want to stop that. That's basically his she didn't say this, but in hindsight, that was his safe stim. I could put a Barney video in and know that I could actually go upstairs and get a shower. I mean, that he was in a gated room with the Barney video in. I was pretty sure he was going to be safe. Um, and if I stop that, then he would get into taking, you know, cans of soda or bottle of water and just dump it out to see that cause and effect. He would dump things. He would climb on things. He would take markers and just write on things. Those are other stims that are not completely dangerous, but well, we don't want him climbing. We don't want him writing on walls or on important papers, 
We don't want him dumping, you know, cans of soda out that I have to clean up. So, you know, watching TV or playing on iPads is, is a lot of times a safe stim. And a lot of typically developing toddlers and preschoolers spend a fair amount of time on electronics too. And so there's that balance too, Kelsey, you know, yeah. where, you know, but, and not to overdo it, like not to spend, you know, four hours a day on an iPad because um, the child really needs to be engaged as much as possible up to all of their waking hours, which is about a hundred hours a week, which breaks people out. But the more engagement you can do, and we, we've got, you know, two online courses, one for toddlers and preschoolers and one for school age now, um, you know, we need to learn how to assess, make a plan, teach all of these skills and evaluate using easy data. So stimming is, is kind of one of these, it's not, it's all throughout and it's not a big deal and it is a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, again, we, we are recording this live and and some of the comments on Facebook are what about, you know, licking and, and mouthing things, which is a type of stim. And that would fall often into the dangerous category. And you do have podcasts on chewing and mouthing items. And so those yeah, people might I mean, want to look at them. In fact, episode 201 and 202 is part one and part two with my interview with Zulika. And we were doing the digital assessment kind of together on these podcasts. And she wanted to know, she's a four-year-old, she wanted to know about how to reduce self, uh, self-injurious behavior and uh, a couple other things. She wanted to like prepare for him to be a teenager. And we did the digital assessment together. And it turns out he's mouthing everything all the time. And, and he's ingesting things, which is called pica. So you're eating it and ingesting. And that's very, very serious. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Tell me more about this mouthing and chewing. And, and as a registered nurse and a behavior analyst, you know, more and a mom, you know, more with my medical hat on, I'm like, when I see chewing and mouthing things and then pica, um, which is ingesting things, inedible things. Um, I think medical, I think things like lead levels, iron levels, zinc, magnesium, copper, like you need these levels done. So Zulika was like all about it. And she's like writing things down. What test should I, I'm like, I don't like to get into that because I mean, I'm a registered nurse, but I don't work as one. And I, I'm not really qualified. I don't really tackle the medical side of autism. I tackle more of the behavioral in a very child-friendly way. But I told her, I said, I, you know, she's like, I'm going to my pediatrician. What, should, what lab test should I get? And I just rattle off, you know, lead, iron, copper, zinc, and magnesium. This is all in episode 201 and 202. And a couple of days later, she posted on TikTok that to say that both of her boys, her four-year-old and her two-year-old, the two-year-old's speech delay, the four-year-old has severe autism Uh, both had high lead levels, like high lead levels in their regular blood test. Um, And now that she's working on that, his mouthing, his pica, his language, his behavior, everything is improving. So I, I think that's a really good point. Like when I see or hear people like, oh, we just give him a chewy all day long, or we have to change his shirt three times a day because he's chewing on his shirt. Like there's something potentially wrong medically. And I would encourage you to listen to that podcast and to work with your healthcare providers to make sure that there's nothing uh, serious going on medically. Yeah. Yeah. Because anything in the mouth and ingesting can be really dangerous. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, let's get to, I believe it's our last question. Um, my child is struggling to learn or engage with anything else. How do I reduce stimming and increase skills when all they seem to want to do is stim? Yeah, so the turn autism around approach is a four step child friendly approach. You assess, which we talked about, you make a plan based on this assessment. 
And then you learn to teach in a child-friendly, easy way with lots of reinforcement, lots of easy skills. Um, and then you use easy data to make sure that the behaviors that are dangerous or impeding their learning are going down, everything else is going up. Obviously, we can't explain what to do in five minutes, but if I were you, I would really dive in. I would at least read the Turn Autism Around book. I you can get it, you can get the first chapter for free and all the book resources at turnautismaround.com. We can link that in the show notes as well. And that's that's at the least. Um, and then I would really, really consider joining our online courses and community. We have um, a podcast episode with Ruth, one of our participants. She's actually taken the toddler course, moved on to the verbal behavior bundle, and she's in our train the trainer program now with her five-year-old. And in the fall, Ruth uh, came on live to, to one of these just Q&A calls and um she told me that she has listened to every single one of my podcasts um, and she had made major strides just helping her child get potty trained and sleep. And I told her she absolutely should join the online course and she did. And so I did a podcast interview with Ruth. We can link that in the show notes as well. But I really do think that there is a danger into staying in what I call the sea of free because, you know, time is go- marching on and it is complicated. Like, you think of Zulika's son, or you think of anybody here that's listening, that's dealing with lack of language or no language or not talking, not conversational, anywhere in between there. You talk about problem behaviors like mouthing things or uh, just excessive scripting or dangerous behaviors like running in the street. And Kelsey dealt with that with, with her son, you know, running in the street, running in water, you know, all of these things. And then you deal with like not being potty trained, being a picky eater. Like it is so complicated. And that's, I think the beauty of my system where we just break everything down. So, you know, you want to do high reinforcement, low demands, do a lot of work with pairing, with reinforcement. Don't, I wouldn't label the, you know, stop saying that. I wouldn't do anything negative. I would just, okay, that's happening a lot. Um, So, you know, just don't panic, just learn more. Procedures are, are also in my book and in my other podcast. So, I mean, just listening and watching today, uh, is your, is your first step. There's just a lot to do and you can learn it, whether you're a parent or a professional, you can learn what to do to help this child that you're worried about asking questions about now and all of your future clients, your other kids, whether they have autism or not, these are the same procedures that work, uh, for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And I would agree with that. Learning more helps because, when we are talking about a child who's stimming all the time, it, it can be really hard to teach them and to reinforce them. And so sometimes you have to look for, you know, if a child loves to line things up, when you're teaching them, you might have a bin and you're giving them pieces as you're engaging them. You know, if a child loves to spin, you might spin them in a spinny chair um, and pause it and do some teaching and then spin again. And you kind of have to look at, Instead of always thinking, how do I stop this? How do I change this? Look at what they're doing today um, and find a way to do something similar and keep building on those things to get closer to leisure skills, closer to teaching. Um, You're not going to go from a child flapping their hands in front of their face all day long to sitting at a table for two hours and teaching. You know, you have to, you have to take steps and, Mary talks about this actually in the stimming guide that we talked about at the beginning of this episode, which is at marybarbera.com forward slash stimming is you cannot just stop a behavior. You can't say, okay, I'm tackling this and I'm stopping it because it will be replaced with something else. And so the more we can focus on how do we teach and how do we reinforce, you know, the skills we want to see um, it's not going to to stop. You're just going to stress yourself out, stress the child out. Um, So the best thing to do is learn how to provide reinforcement in the courses, how to teach at the table, 
um, how to teach the right language skills. You see a lot of kids stimming excessively uh, because maybe they're bored or maybe the skills are way too high. So, so that's why assessment comes really, really useful. Yeah. And look for clues, you know, what do, how do they stim? Like Kelsey was saying, if they like spinning themselves, how can I spin them and be a part of that and spin them in a spinny chair? Um, Also with scripting, I don't recommend that you get um, talking about the scripts. Um, We did an episode on Gestalt language processing uh, with Sari Risen a while back and we can link that in the show notes. And she actually did a 16 page uh, critical review of Gasalt and both of our kids, Kelsey's son, Brentley and my son, Lucas, I mean, they would be considered Gestalt language processing. They had little scripts, you know, Lucas would say Arthur's tooth. And uh, he still says occasionally, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, you know, um, he still, when he hits his elbow or, or, you know, crashes into something, he goes, are you okay? You know, so that's okay. That's a clue. Okay. So he's Arthur's tooth when he was in pain, when he scunned his knee. Okay. That's great. Cause at least I know Arthur's tooth means he's in pain. Or if he bangs something and says, are you okay? I know that he's at least indicating in some way he's in pain. So now I need to put my, you know, thinking cap on and think, okay, how can we teach him to tell, you know, because strangers may not know that or pick up on that. So we're just looking for clues. You know, their stimming and scripting um, may look abnormal now. All we need to do, we don't need to stamp it out. We don't need to stop it. We just need to use it to, like Kelsey said, use it as reinforcement. We literally, when when we started, Lucas liked to dump things so much that we had these Barney cards and the, the consultant even recommended this, like after some tasks, he, we give it to him and we say, dump it. Like let him dump it. And then it became like under control and we used his stimming. You know, some kids who like to line things up also like to, do inset puzzles on the alphabet, you know, they could be, you know, scripting letters or words, and we've done some work on hyperlexia, we can link. So it's just really looking for clues and how to use what they love, because if they're stimming and scripting, they love it. So let's, let's use that as clues to get into the world to help them reach their fullest potential, whatever that is. Yeah, I think that's a good way to sum it up. All right. And for the opt-in for the free download about stimming, you can go to marybarbera.com forward slash stimming. And we have all the resources that we mentioned at marybarbera.com forward slash 231 um, when this episode airs in about a month. So hope you loved it. And I will see you and you'll hear me next week. Same time, same place. Take care.